Okay, this is the complete beginner's guide on how to lose body fat. I lost about 40 pounds of body fat, gained about 20 pounds of muscle, but it took me four years becoming a personal trainer, becoming a nutrition coach in order for me to learn how to do it the right way and also keep the body fat off once I lost it. You're going to get all that information broken down in about 10, 20 minutes. We're going to talk about why move more, eat less is bullshit. Not all the way bullshit. There's a few grains of truth here and there, but it's all about how you move more and how you eat less. That's the key. And we're also going to talk about how to lose fat the right way, which involves a calorie deficit, your protein intake, your strength training routine, your cardio routine, what you're doing for cardio, what you're doing for recovery, and one bonus tip at the very, very end. Let's get into it. Cool. Why move more, eat less is bullshit. Like I said, um, it's all about how you move more and how you eat less. There's four problems that can happen when you move more and eat less. One of them is eating way too little. So I'll often have uh, women or men come into the gym. Harvard Health mentions anything below 1,500 calories a day for men, anything below 1,200 calories a day for women uh, risks nutrient deficiency. If you eat less than those amounts, you risk becoming nutrient deficient, not getting enough calories or nutrients in your diet to be able to function properly. Oftentimes, we'll have women that come in eating 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 calories per day, not losing weight. Men about 1,500 calories per day, not losing weight. And these people slash their calories right away thinking, hey, dude, I'm super motivated. I want fat loss to happen fast. I've been fat my entire life. I want to make it happen. Let's go. Let's go. What happens is you make a few days, a few weeks of super quick progress, one, two, three, four weeks, and then eventually you plateau. And then you start to ask yourself, hey, wait, why am I plateauing? I'm barely eating food. I barely have energy throughout the day. I'm super hungry. What's going on? It's because you hit a, uh, your metabolism went in a survival mode. Your body fat is there for survival. It's stored energy. And when you try to slash all your calories right away, your metabolism, its main purpose is survival. So it thinks, hey, there's not a lot of food in my environment right now. Food is scarce. We're going into a famine. Let's hold on to our body fat for dear survival and start burning less energy throughout the day so we can survive. So number one mistake is eating way too little. Number two mistake when it comes to move more, eat less is eating less protein. Eating less protein Protein builds and maintains muscle mass. Protein has a high thermic effect, meaning it burns, you burn calories by eating protein because it takes your body energy to break down and digest uh, protein, carbs, fats, alcohol into energy. Protein has the highest thermic effect. Um, so when you eat less protein, you're not really helping yourself out. And uh, protein keeps you full throughout the day. So when you eat less protein, you're not building and maintaining muscle mass very well. You're not burning calories through the thermic effect and you're not staying very full. So. It's not very beneficial for fat loss. Um, number three reason, you start moving more, but you're doing the wrong workouts. You're doing like high intensity interval training. You're starting to do cardio. Maybe you're doing like classes that have weights, but it's more of a cardio based class. You're running out of breath compared to traditional strength training where you're really just focusing on building muscle like a bench press where you're moving up, controlling the weight on the way down, doing a certain amount of reps that are close to failure where you can't do anymore, stopping the set, taking about one or two minutes of rest time in between sets so your muscles can recover and be able to push hard again. That's the type of training you want to do, not the wrong workouts, which is like high intensity interval training, cardio, and pretty much anything else. Number four reason why move more, eat less is bullshit. You might do the right routine, but you might be doing it the wrong way. You might have a strength training routine. You might be doing the bench press and the squats and the deadlifts and all that jazz, but you might be doing it the wrong way. There's some scientific principles of uh, exercising like progressive overload, training close to failure, lifting with the right form, not using momentum and having a well-rounded routine that incorporates all your body parts. You want to make sure you're doing that when you're strength training. Oftentimes, you'll see people lifting in the gym and just uh, using a bunch of momentum to throw up the weights to do the bicep curl. Maybe they're just training like chest and arms and they they don't train legs at all. Legs is your entire lower half of your body. There's a lot of muscle growth to be happening there. There's a lot of places to work out that you're completely missing out on. So as you can see, moving more, eating less seems pretty simple, but you can definitely go wrong with it. Now, how do you actually create a calorie deficit for fat loss? First question you have to ask yourself is what is a calorie deficit? Well, a calorie deficit is getting calories out higher than calories in. Calories inside is pretty simple. It's the food and the liquid that you ingest into your body. The ones that people tend to forget about is the sauces, the syrups, the coffee creamers, oil spray that says zero calories but actually has calories. Every second you spray is about 15 calories. Um, cooking oils that you use in the condiments as well. Don't forget about those. Alcohol as well, beer, all has calories. Calories out. Now that one's a little more complicated and I'm going to break it down super simple. But the four things that affect calories out is your basal metabolic rate, 
your TEF, which is the thermic effect of food, your NEAT, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, and EAT, exercise activity thermogenesis. What does that all, all that mean in plain English? Well, basal metabolic rate is how many calories you burn at rest. Imagine you wake up, you did nothing, you laid in bed, you didn't even eat food, you did not do jack throughout the rest of the day. That's how many calories you burn at rest. 60% of the calories that you burn throughout the day come from your basal metabolic rate. So it's super important to keep that high because as you see, exercise only accounts for 15% of the calories that you burn. A lot of people are like, hey, let me stop doing strength training. Let me do a bunch of exercise throughout the day. That way I can lose fat. You're completely forgetting about your basal metabolic rate, which accounts for 60% of the calories you burn. So you want to keep that high and we'll get into how you can keep that high. Thermic effect of food, which is the energy it takes to break down food into its component parts throughout your digestive system so your body can actually absorb it. Unfortunately, you cannot eat steak and steak just pass through <laughs> and steak just goes straight into your muscles. You have to break down steak into its component parts, into the amino acids that feed throughout the rest of your body. So it takes energy for that process to happen. Neat is non-exercise activity. So any activity that's not planned. Wife, wife is mad at you, tells you to go get the mail because you haven't got the mail or go take the trash out. For you to go step outside the house and take the trash out, you spend energy doing that. When you're cooking food, it takes energy for you to do that. When you're sitting down and working or recording a video like I'm doing right now, it takes energy for me to do that. So this is all activity um, and that accounts for total daily caloric burn. About 15% of your daily calories come from this. About 15% of your daily calories come from planned exercise. So cardio, weightlifting, you structuring time out of your day to go and exercise. About 15 calories come, 15% of your calories come from there. Cool. Now, how do you actually do that? What are actionable tips that you can do in your own life right now to make that happen? Well, when it comes to eating less, um, you know, decreasing the count amount of calories going in well you eat and drink less calories sounds pretty simple but what are the best tips in order to do that 80 to 90 percent of your calories should be coming from single ingredient whole foods so this is like lean proteins fish poultry dairy eggs egg whites i could go on and on but foods that don't have an ingredient label right because you don't need an ingredient label for a banana because the only thing inside the banana is the banana it's not banana artificial sweeteners, soy lecithin, guar gum, added sugars, right? It's just a banana. So when you look throughout your cart, when you're grocery shopping, 80 to 90% should be single ingredient whole foods. Maybe like two or three ingredients in the food is completely fine. Sometimes it's like pasta and they have like an emulsifier mix in there. It's not a big deal. What you want to avoid is the highly processed foods that have multiple ingredients on the ingredient label. Um, less if any liquid calories, your majority... Uh, focus when it comes to weight loss is removing the liquid calories. So whether it's like a Starbucks caramel macchiato or, you know, a high calorie iced tea or your energy drinks that have a bunch of sugar, soda that has a bunch of sugar, Gatorade, you want to remove these because these are empty calories. They really don't make you feel full. They don't give you a whole lot of energy. They might give you a quick energy and then you crash right after. Um, besides giving you that enjoyment, that people get from yeah, drinking liquid calories. Um, if you want to lose weight and want to be successful with it, liquid calories are going to be a huge tip to cut out. Switching from fatty meats to leaner meats. This makes your diet not even feel like a diet because instead of eating chicken thighs, you eat chicken breasts. Instead of eating 80-20 beef, you eat 90-10 beef. Um, you just want to look for the leaner versions of what you already eat and these little alternative switches make you feel like you're not even on a diet. More home-cooked meals, definitely going to help out. You don't know... Um, you know, when you're eating out, you don't know what's in the foods that could be covered in oils, dressing, sauces, butters. You don't even know what's in there, right? Um, and if you do eat out, ask for those things to be put on the side and you can always share dessert. So that's a way you can decrease the amount of calories coming in. Now, how do you increase the amount of calories being expended out? Seven to nine hours of quality sleep. Why does sleep matter for getting energy out? Because lack of sleep affects how moody you are the next day, how tired you are the next day, your hormones, dopamine, leptin, ghrelin, testosterone, cortisol, all these have a certain effect on your mood and your metabolism and your body's regulation of just how everything is going on. So want to make sure that you knock out seven to nine hours of high quality sleep. That's not seven hours in bed, okay? There's a difference there because it takes you about 10, 20, 30 minutes to fall asleep. You wake up in the middle of the night. So seven hours at least of high quality sleep. Building muscle mass with three to four days of strength training, 45 to 75 minutes per day. That's useful because it keeps your metabolism high again and it makes sure you lose body fat for fuel because you give your body a sign that, hey, I don't want to lose muscle. I want to keep the muscle on. 
and I want to lose body fat. Because the worst thing that can happen is you start losing weight, but you start losing muscle and your body fat remains the same. You want to control your stress levels. If cortisol is high, it's not going to help you out a lot when it comes to fat loss. And we'll get into how to control all these factors. Um, eating a high protein, high fiber diet, going to help you stay full, stay satiated, stay sane, as well as um, keep burning calories throughout the day because protein fiber it actually takes a lot of energy for it to break down those two nutrients and then adding more physical activity throughout your day which ones something that's up to your preference something that's enjoyable something that's low fatigue psychologically and or physically because you're already fatiguing yourself when it comes to being in a caloric deficit you're already fatiguing yourself when it comes to strength training in the gym you have other stress factors going on it wants to work life relationships the last thing you want to do is add a bunch of stress by doing morning runs that are just boom, 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 boom on your joints, on your knees, on your ankles, on your hips. You definitely can. You definitely can. But I find that not a lot of people actually enjoy that. And when I tell them like, hey, you don't actually have to go on runs to lose weight. They're like, oh, I just won't. I'll do something else. Now, protein sake, let's talk about why is protein important. Like we mentioned, uh, eating protein burns more calories compared to eating carbs and fats because it takes energy to break down. Uh, protein builds and maintains muscle mass, which burns more calories throughout the day. Protein makes sure you burn fat for fuel instead of muscle because protein breaks down into amino acids and uh, your muscle needs those amino acids to be able to build and maintain itself. And it keeps you full and satisfied throughout the day. That's why protein is important. Best sources. You can DM me free on Instagram at CoachXLE to get a free grocery list of literally the best foods that you want for fat loss, a three-day strength training routine, and a weight tracker. However, if you don't want to do all that work, it's not a lot of work, but uh, best sources of protein is going to be lean meats, fish, poultry, uh, low-fat, non-fat dairy, like non-fat, uh, low-fat cheese, non-fat Greek yogurt, fat-free milk, uh, 1% milk even works, eggs, egg whites, protein powders like whey, casein, soy, pure rice, uh, pea rice blend, or vegan sources of protein like legumes, beans, Peas, lentils, nuts, seeds, all great sources. If you're eating a bunch of vegan proteins, try to include some animal sources. It's not the highest quality, most bioavailable to get vegan sources. You can definitely make it work. It just becomes a little bit harder. Now, how much do you need when it comes to protein intake? Well, it definitely depends. But if you're in a fat loss phase, I would keep these three numbers, this range into account. 0.7 to 1.2 grams of protein per pound of body weight. Now, when it comes to building muscle mass, they've done a bunch of studies. They did a meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is a study of a bunch of studies put together. And they found that in the meta-analysis that after eating 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight, there's no real gains that you make in terms of muscle mass, um, in terms of building muscle mass. So 0.7 is the bare minimum intake uh, that you should eat. Now, what are certain benefits to going above that if there's no benefits in terms of muscle gain? Well, when you're in a fat loss diet, you're more likely to burn muscle for fuel. So those extra amino acids from that protein can definitely help out. When you're in a fat loss diet, you're going to experience hunger. So that extra protein can help you stay more full throughout the day. When you're in a fat loss phase, you want to burn as many calories as possible. So if you get more protein compared to getting more carbs and fats, the thermic effect of protein is really high. So you're going to be burning more calories compared to getting it from carbs and fats. So I would say that one gram of protein per pound of body weight is the optimal intake that you want to shoot for. And then 1.2 grams of protein per pound is the higher end. Anything past that, I wouldn't really recommend because if you're in a fat loss diet, uh, you want to make sure you're meeting the minimum carb and fat requirements to be able to have energy throughout the day, support your hormone health, and just, um, you know, for basic function. So uh, anything past 1.2, I wouldn't recommend. Um, yeah, 0.7, 1, and 1.2. Stay somewhere in that range at all times, and you should be pretty good. Now, for obese people, you might be 250 pounds, and you're like, hey, dude, do I need to get 250 grams of protein in? That's, that's very excessive. Good news is, no, you don't, because it's not based on your body weight. It's more based on lean body mass, how much lean body mass you have. So to calculate that out, it's a little bit complicated. A good simple rule to shoot for is just use your height in centimeters as the amount of grams per, grams of protein you need on a daily basis. So if you're five foot nine, how many inches is that? Well, that's 69 inches. And to get centimeters, you multiply inches by 2.54. For a five foot nine person, they are 175 centimeters tall. They would eat 175 grams of protein on a daily basis to start losing weight. Now, best tips to get more protein in throughout the day. You want to baby step it up. It's going to take time for some. You want to set the measure of success. 
pretty low because that's what's going to keep you consistent instead of going way outside of your comfort zone. So if you're eating 80 grams of protein per day right now, you want to get to 150, say this week my goal is to get to 100. The week after that, 115. The week after that, 130. And kind of baby step it up depending on where you're at, your levels of willpower, motivation, etc. Um, understand that it's going to take time for some people. Number two tip is start off the day with a high protein breakfast. People say, hey, if you were to eat a frog, when would you do? Would you eat the frog? Uh, would you wait in anticipation and eat the frog at the end of the day and kind of like dread your day just thinking about, oh man, I got to eat the frog? Or would you just get it up and done first thing in the morning so you don't have to worry about it? Well, you would do the first, right? You would get it up and done. Same thing with your protein and say, if you get a lot of protein knocked out, Yes, you want to have a rough even spread of protein, but if you start off the day with like 40, 50, 60 grams of protein, you give yourself super nice momentum to be able to carry that into your second, third, fourth meal throughout the day compared to starting off pretty low and now it hits like 2 p.m. and you're like, damn, I got to get like 150 grams of protein. How am I going to do this, right? So high protein breakfast definitely helps out big time, definitely satiates you a whole lot. And I would uh, spread out roughly evenly over three to six meals throughout the day. So if you have a hard time getting protein in throughout the day and you're only eating two or three meals, well, consider having more meals, right? And this can include snacks or shakes, whether it's those protein bars, whether it's a quick little protein shake that you mix with just almond milk or just water. Try spreading it out more. Instead of 50 grams at one meal, try like 25 grams uh, at each meal, but just having more meals throughout the day. Uh, best foods for just getting a whole lot of protein in. You want to have a high focus on lean meats and you want to have a high focus on um, low-fat dairy, eggs, and egg whites, like non-fat Greek yogurt, cheese, low-fat cheese, fat-free milk, eggs, egg whites, and then lean meats like lean ground beef, lean ground turkey, chicken breast, can light tuna, and salmon. This should be your main focus. This should be where it's at. This is why it's so hard for vegans to do it because they can't eat any of these foods. These foods are so low calorie and so protein dense compared to everything else that it's just going to make your job a whole lot easier when it comes to fat loss. Now, when it comes to double, sc uh, double scooping protein powder is the best hack to get in more protein. That's literally 50 grams and about 200 to 300 calories. Double scoop protein powder into a shaker bottle. Put water in there. Put on sweet almond milk in there. Shake it up. Bada bing, bada boom. That's 50 grams. I mean, how easier does it get, ladies and gentlemen? All right, let's talk about strength training and why strength training is important for fat loss. Now, why strength training is important for fat loss is number one, it's gonna burn muscle for fuel if you do not strength train because as you continue to lose weight, you need your body needs a good reason to keep muscle on your body. If you do not continue to strength train with weights, there's no reason for your muscles to stay on. Your body doesn't need your muscles and it wants to hold on to body fat for survival. So it's going to continue to burn muscle for fuel instead of body fat. A lack of strength training will also decrease your resting metabolism, which causes weight regain. A lot of people lose weight, but then they regain it back. Your resting metabolism, your BMR, is responsible for 60% of the calories that you burn throughout the day. And what increases your BMR, what keeps it high, is your muscle mass that you have on your body. A lack of strength training will also make you weak, frail, and skinny. Usually when people want to lose weight, they want to lose body fat. They want to look good when they lean down. Now, oftentimes when people do not strength train and just continue to lose, lose weight, people start asking them like, dude, are you sick? Are you okay? Like, what's going on? It's not that they're sick. It's just that they've lost all the muscle mass on their body and they look very frail. Now, what's important is also how you do your strength training. Strength training is important, but it's also how you do the strength training that's important. So, two things that you want to take into account. Uh, a few things you want to take into account here. Number one is progressive overload, which is increasing weight from workout to workout, increasing reps from workout to workout, slowing down the tempo of the movement or improving your form. So these are all ways to progressive overload and progressive overload in simple terms, it just means make it harder. Make the workout harder every time you come to a gym. So if you lift 25 pounds for 10 reps on a chest press, next week when you come in or next workout when you come in, try to beat it either by increasing the amount of weight you're using from 25 to 27.5 or 30 pounds, or you can increase the amount of reps. Say you did 10 reps last week. Now you want to shoot for 11 or 12. You can also, those are the two simplest ways to do it, increasing weight or increasing reps. Another way you could do it is also slow down the tempo of the movement. So instead of doing a chest press like this, where you're doing it with good form, you could also do a chest press, move it up, and then really control it, really slow it down on the way down, which is pretty good for body weight movements. 
because you can't really add weight to a body weight movement. So another way you could progress it is by slowing down the tempo of the push up or whatever body weight movement you're doing. Another way is to improve your form. Now your form should be dialed down before you start adding weight or reps. But if you've been spending some time in the gym, not even thinking about form, kind of just thinking, hey, as long as I feel in the muscle, I'm good. Well, there's a lot more to it, right? So if you've been in the gym for a while and if you really dial down your form and spend some time researching YouTube videos on how to lift the right way, maybe the best gains, that's the best way to progress out of all these ways I just mentioned, improving your form is the best way to progressive overload. Now, another exercise science variable you want to take into account is training close to failure. This is extremely crucial because if you do not train close to failure, there's no, there's no reason your muscle should grow. So yes, you want to progressive overload, but you don't want to use like five pounds. If you're a grown man using like five pounds to dumbbell curl and the next week do a 7.5 pounds. You want to make sure you're training close to failure, which is when your muscles can't handle any more load. So if I'm doing a bicep curl and I'm going and I'm going and I, I'm trying to squeeze out more, but my bicep just can't lift anymore and it completely gives out. That was failure. And you don't have to train all the way to failure, but you want to train about one or two reps away from that point. And what that's going to do is send a signal to your body that, hey, the muscle that we have right now, it's not enough for the load that's being consistently placed on us. So we need to tear ourselves down to get bigger. Like I said, you want to make sure your form is on point because if you don't lift the right way, if you're not lifting with the right form, it just doesn't matter. I can't tell you how many people are doing rows or chest presses with their back arch like crazy and just throwing up the weight up and down and just using heavy weights yet their muscles are not really growing or they're doing rows, right? Like cable rows are like this, but they're moving their back, they're moving their hips and they're just throwing it back with their shoulders. And I'm just thinking in my head, I used to make the same mistake and I'm just thinking in my head like that, that's such a waste, you know? Your back is getting very little stimulus. The point of a row is to work out your back, but they're just moving their arms just like this and then throwing their hips into it. And I'm like, bruh. Okay, next one is compound movements. You wanna make sure you're doing compound movements. So. If you don't like spending a lot of time in gym or you just, I mean, anyone, um, any beginner should be doing their compound exercises. And these are like a bench press, a shoulder press, a row, either a pull down or a pull up, some sort of squatting movement, some sort of hip hinging movement, like a deadlift or a Romanian deadlift or a good morning. And then a lunge, single leg movement, and then a carry. You include those eight movement patterns into your workout. You're working a bunch of muscles at the same time. A compound movement is one that works out multiple muscle groups, multiple joints all at the same time, multiple joint movements. So you can do a chest workout, a shoulder workout, and a tricep workout, or you could do a bench press that works out your chest, your shoulder, and triceps all at the same time. Now, how many days per week should you lift? A lot of people have these questions. How many days per week? How long should I spend in the gym? Well, it all depends on how much muscle do you want to build. Now, if you're in a weight loss phase, fat loss phase, and you're like, dude, I just want to like look toned. I just want to lose weight. I know strength training is a key part of it. I don't really want to spend too much time in the gym. I don't care about big muscles. Then I would do three days per week, 45 minute workouts, 60 minute workouts. As long as you're doing that and you're doing it the right way with progressive overload, training close to failure, lifting with good form and using compound movements, you're going to be A1 solid. However, if you're like, dude, I want to lose fat, but I also want to look pretty muscular. I want the big old biceps. I want nice shoulders. I want nice chest. I want that chiseled back, then I would recommend more days in the gym. If you're just starting off, even three or four days is great to start off for your first six to 12 months. And you can continue doing that for the rest of your career, um, training career. But say you're like 12 months in and you want to continue progressing. Yeah, a fifth or sixth day might definitely help out. And if you're confused on what kind of strength training routine to start with, DM me free on Instagram at CoachXAli. And you're going to get a free grocery list of the best foods for fat loss. You're going to get a three-day strength training routine on what you need to do at the gym. That's dumbbell and body weight only. So you can go inside a corner of the gym. You don't have to learn how to use the machines. Um, go inside a busy gym. You can go inside a corner, grab a pair of dumbbells. That workout routine will show you how, um, how to do that pretty much. And a weight tracker to log your weight, see weekly averages and compare, compare weekly averages of weight loss. Cardio. Let's talk about why it's not that important for fat loss. It's not as important as you think because most people do cardio, hop into a weight loss routine, think, let me restrict my calories. Let me do a bunch of cardio. They see a little bit of weight loss, but the body fat stays on. Why is this? Because you're not doing strength training, man, because you're not doing strength training. Your body has no reason to hold on to your muscles it has all the reason to hold on your body fat because body fat is stored energy and needs it for survival. So if you just do cardio, no strength training, your, your body's going to burn muscle for fuel instead of body fat. You want the opposite. 
Um, so cardio should be thought of as a supplement to your fat loss routine, not the bare bones, holy grail of fat loss. Your holy grail of fat loss, the bare bones routine should be at least three days of resistance training, 45 minutes per day, eating less calories than you burn, keeping a high protein intake, having good sleep and controlling your stress. That should be the bare bones minimum. That is your holy grail of fat loss. Cardio is merely a supplement to speed it up. Or if you want to eat a little bit more food, and then include more cardio to burn more calories, you can have that trade-off as well. But it's not the bare bones. Now, another reason why cardio is not that important, because think about it, 500 um, calories of cardio, I mean, that's a five-mile jog or a run. That's 30 minutes of high-intensity interval training. That's an hour of 40 minutes of walking at three miles per hour. That is 500 calories. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work on your joints if you're doing high-intensity interval training or you're doing jogs and runs. However, 500 calories of food, how quick can that go by? That is literally one donut. That is a McDonald's medium French fries with ketchup. That is a few pieces of chocolate. And that is five tablespoons of peanut butter. Five tablespoons of peanut butter can knock out your 50 minutes of jogging and running you did. How sad is that? How sad? That was so much work. All, all with a mere five tablespoons of peanut butter that is completely knocked out. So you start to understand why, you know, cardio is cool, but it's not everything. So, uh, when it comes to cardio, I don't think of getting steps in per day as cardio. Cardio is more like intentional biking, jogging, swimming, stuff like that. Um, you want to make sure you're at least getting 7K steps in per day, right? Um, so if you have a super active job, you're probably already getting this and you can rock and roll without doing more steps or more cardio. However, if you do have that super active job, keep rocking with that up until you start to see your weight loss plateau. And then um, you can think about getting more steps in. However, if you don't have an active job, if you're very sedentary, let's get 7K steps in per day. That's going to be minimal impact on your joints. It's going to be not even feel like cardio. You could do a 20-minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You could do a 60-minute walk after dinner. Um, you could just focus on being more active throughout the day, parking in the back of a grocery shop, uh, and then walking to the front, uh, making intentional like phone calls while you're walking around, maybe getting a standing desk at work and, you know, moving around as you're standing. That's definitely going to burn a whole lot more calories just by being active. Um, but you want to make sure you're getting that 7K steps in just for basic health, basic movement, not feeling tight because you're stuck on a desk all day, kind of like me right now. Um, and just to stay burning calories. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just going to become very restricted. You're not burning a lot of calories throughout the day and you're going to have to eat bare bones, minimum amounts of food. You're not going to want to do that. Okay. So if fat loss is plateaued, you want to ask yourself, are you doing the fundamentals correctly? If not, then take care of the fundamentals. If you are taking care of the fundamentals correctly, then you progress to the next step. And the next step would be to ask yourself, hey, what would I hate more? Would I hate decreasing food more or would I hate increasing activity more? If you get to a plateau and you're like, dude, I'm already eating a decent amount of food. Um, I, I don't mind decreasing my food even more. I don't mind decreasing my calories. Then cool, decrease calories. But if you're like, dude, I'm already eating like very little food. I don't want to decrease even more. I'm a foodie. I love food. Then start increasing your activity more through steps. I really recommend just getting more steps in throughout the day. It's easy to track if you have a step tracker and it's a minimal impact, minimal stress. It doesn't even feel like cardio. But you can uh, start to include a little bit more cardio. You can start with like three to four sessions of 20 to 30 minutes of medium intensity cardio where you're really working up sweat. Um, this would be like biking, jogging, a stairmaster, doing the rower, doing the elliptical. Um, you could consider adding that and that would be completely up to your choice. One's not better than the other um, if we're just taking fat loss into consideration. And then which form of cardio you might ask? Well, you want to pick one that's enjoyable, feels the less, least restrictive, uh, least stress on your joints. It's the least fatiguing, right? It doesn't make you feel like you're really doing cardio because it's going to be in our physical stress. And if you don't like doing your cardio, you're just not going to show up to do it. Um, and most important one is that you can keep doing it after your fat loss phase. The worst type of cardio you could do is be like, okay, I hate this cardio, but I want to lose body fat. So I'm going to do it just so I get to my goal. What's going to happen when you get to your goal? Those people are like, I don't know. You're going to have to keep doing that cardio. And if you can't keep doing that cardio, if you don't like doing that cardio, then, uh, you know, you're just going to regain all that weight back. And I'm sorry, that's bad news. It's just what's going to happen. So recovery, when it comes to recovery, what do you need to know? It's going to be stress and sleep. Why controlling stress is important. There's something called general adaptation syndrome. It is the process of your body adapting to stress. And if you have stress from work life relationships happening, and if you have stress from exercise in the gym, 
because your exercise is a stressor and then you're stressing yourself out through putting yourself in caloric restriction and a calorie deficit, then your body can only adapt to so many stresses. And if you have all that happening, it's very hard for your body to adapt to the strength training routine and be able to push harder when it comes to any type of exercise, pushing yourself to do more steps and pushing yourself to be more active, pushing yourself to have that willpower. So a big thing you want to do is just control the stress that's going on outside of the gym work, life, relationships, finances, whatever's going on. See if you can control that stress. If there's uncontrollable stress, then meditation, yoga, prayer, socializing with your friends, going to therapy, men go to therapy and um, having a sense of purpose, having a wind down routine before bed, setting a day to just relax and not think about all your responsibilities and just, you know, kind of unwind. <laughs> I definitely need more of that. Um, that stuff can definitely, definitely help out big time. Yep. Now, why, uh, why sleep is important. Let's see if I mix it. Yeah, and a uh, big thing with stress is stress makes you want to feel not stressed. That's pretty simple, but you have to think about the coping mechanisms that happen when people feel stressed out. Now, you might not do drugs, alcohol, super unhealthy coping mechanisms that people have, but you know, common ones that is society acceptable is being lazy, procrastinating, not going to a gym, not doing your meal plan, not grocery shopping, not meal prepping, um, and not eating healthy foods, giving into the junk foods because the dopamine hit from the junk foods, the sugar high makes you forget about the stress. So um, it's not the stress, uh, general adaptation syndrome that's pretty important, but you also want to think about like, you know, the coping mechanisms you have to stress. And if you're super stressed out, you might give it into those. Now sleep, why is sleep important? Well, we can talk about the hor hunger hormones, leptin and ghrelin, which are, you know, leptin makes you feel full, ghrelin makes you feel hungry. If you're sleep deprived, especially <laughs> consistently sleep deprived, you're messing with the balance of those hunger hormones, which are not good, which is gonna lead to cravings and hunger the next day. Testosterone is one of the key drivers behind muscle growth. You take a man's testosterone away, you make take away a man's drive and a man's ability to put on and recover from the gym, to put on muscle mass and recover from the gym. A lot of that is testosterone, right? Uh, when people take steroids and become super big, they're increasing their levels of testosterone to be able to do that. Uh, cortisol, you're gonna increase the amount of cortisol you have throughout the day. Cortisol is very catabolic. It's not very beneficial for putting on muscle mass. You wanna keep cortisol low, just we, like we talked about. You wanna keep stress low. Um, a lack of sleep, a sleep deprivation is gonna keep cortisol high. Sleep is also gonna affect your dopamine Sleep deprivation is going to affect your dopamine centers. Dopamine is the molecule of pursuit. Dopamine is the molecule of go drive. Like I wake up and I want to get after my goals. That is a high level of dopamine. The unfortunate thing is modern day technology and habits like, you know, porn and scrolling social media and junk food, all these like are messing with our dopamine levels so crazy that we have no drive to delay our gratification anymore. Everything's instant gratification. However, you know, sleep is going to mess with that dopamine level as well. So to put it in English, sleep is important because if you lack sleep, you will become more moody the next day. You will become more irritated the next day. You will feel more tired throughout the day. You will feel more hunger and more cravings, all of which are not beneficial to sticking to a workout routine, sticking to a diet plan, and having consistency, motivation, and willpower. How much? Seven to nine hours of sleep is recommended, and that's seven hours actually of sleep. That's not seven hours in bed. So if you're in bed from 10 to 5, it's gonna take you about 20, 30 minutes to fall asleep, right? And then you might wake up in the middle of the night. So in total, you might've got six to six and a half hours of sleep. You wanna make sure you're getting seven hours of sleep. Most people fall in between where their optimal amount is eight hours of sleep. How do you know if you need more sleep? You might be asking yourself this. Well, good question to ask yourself is, hey, if I shut out my caffeine, like let's do a day without caffeine. Let's do this as a science experiment. Let's do a day without caffeine. And uh, you notice yourself not just irritated and, you know, kind of moody and you're like, damn, I wish I had a little bit of caffeine, but you're like, dude, I've been, you're constantly tired. You're just gone. You need sleep. You're taking a midday nap. You're sleepy at 2 p.m. Then there's a good reason that you are sleep deprived. You're just masking it with the amount of caffeine that you're taking. Number two way to tell if you need more sleep is if you feel like you need more sleep when you wake up. Your body is so good at telling you what you need, right? If you actually pay attention to it. So if you wake up, and you're like, dude, it's not the laziness where it's like, ah, oh, dude, I got to force myself to get out of bed. But you can actually physically feel your mind and body just needs rest. Then you probably need more sleep, right? <laughs> to put it simple. Um, if you wake up on an off day, like a Saturday, Sunday, where you don't have to get up early and go to work and you sleep in for an extra three to six hours that day, 
that is a high chance that you're sleep deprived throughout the week. If you have to take midday naps, if you feel groggy midday, if you feel tired midday, then that's a high chance that you either need more sleep or you just need to make your sleep higher quality and you lack high quality sleep. Now, how to actually get better sleep if you want to lose fat? Well, you're going to set three alarms. One's going to be a wake up alarm. So you don't have to stress about waking up on time when you, uh, you know, when you go to bed. One's a wind down alarm. I set my wind down alarm for about, uh, for seven o'clock. That's the time I have to be home, start winding down for bed, have my last meal. And a sleep alarm at 8 o'clock, I have to be in bed pretty much falling asleep, right? And that's going to help me just stick to it because, you know, you can't get good sleep if you don't go to sleep at a certain time. Most people have wake-up alarms. They don't have sleep alarms. Sleep alarms, super beneficial. Uh, tip number two, you want to get more sunlight throughout the day, especially morning sunlight. Even on cloudy days, just going outside and getting that like natural sunlight into your eyes. It does something where it activates certain processes in your body. Dr. Huberman did a full episode on this. But if you think back to our ancestral days, our ancestors used to wake up as uh, as soon as the sun riz. And that sunlight, when it hit their eyes, it meant it was time to go hunt. It meant is their circadian clock had to turn on. Their circadian rhythm had to turn on. And when you get that light into your eyes, Dr. Huberman mentions that activates certain processes throughout your body, it activates a sleep timer that within 12, 14, 16 hours from now, I'm actually supposed to start activating uh, the parts of my body that help me fall asleep. The, the molecules, the hormones that help me fall asleep, which is one of them being adenosine. So, Morning sunlight, crucial, and you want to make sure you get it through bare eyes, not through sunglasses, not through your windshield, not through a window, but through bare eyes. You don't have to directly look at the sun, just in the direction the sun is at. As long as the day is bright outside, or even if it's not bright, just getting that natural sunlight into your eyes. Shut out all the lights in the room, whether it's the LEDs from the laptop, the lights overhead, or if you get a light in coming in from the street, you can start using blackout curtains and just make sure it's absolute pitch dark. Uh, kind of like a horror movie, you know, you might get a little scared. That's okay. You can call me. I, I can calm you down. Um, and a quiet environment. So just like pitch, pitch, quiet. Uh, consider using earmuffs or little earplugs if you live by loud neighbors. Have a wind down routine. Meditation, stretching, prayer can all help out big time. Have consistent sleep times. So I think this is, this is a big one. This is a big one. Your body just knows, hey, I eat at certain times throughout the day. I sleep at this time. I wake up at this time night in, night out, maybe on the weekends, maybe one day per week. Even that is not too, too good. But, uh, you know, something is better than nothing. Consistent sleep times. To, for me, it's 8 p.m. and waking up at 4 a.m. My body just knows that I'm supposed to get tired right around 6 p.m., 7 p.m. and get ready for bed going into 8 p.m. Uh, limit caffeine intake. This is going to be a big one. If you want to get better sleep, limit your caffeine intake. Caffeine has a half-life of five to six hours. So if you ingest 300 milligrams of caffeine right now, Within five to six hours, you're still going to have 150 milligrams of caffeine floating through your bloodstream. Within five to six hours of that, 75 milligrams. So you can see it's important to shut down caffeine and take 10, 12 hours before bedtime. If I'm going to sleep at 10 p.m., I want to start dr stop drinking my caffeine at 10 a.m. The worst sleep mistakes you can make to get better sleep or not ruin your sleep is going to be training late at night right? Doesn't really help out a lot. You start getting excited. Um, huge meals before bedtime. Now for me, eating a decent sized meal of carbs and fats really just puts my body to rest. It really knocks me out. And I'm like, dude, I just want to go to bed, especially after a day of hard work and working out. However, if I had a humongous meal, just stuffed myself with like high sugar up until I was sick, almost like binge ate almost like that's going to convert a lot of my body's energy towards digesting that food. And I'm just going to lie there awake because my body, my metabolism is so active. I'm going to have a problem falling asleep. So you want to play around with that one, two, three hours before bed, start cutting off your last meal, social media news, arguments before bed, anything that stimulates you is, is, is not very beneficial. Your mind is just going to be racing. Um, anything to do with your work. If you're a workaholic like me, it's, uh, try to shut that stuff off you know, one, two hours before bed and then stressing about sleep over stressing about sleep, getting a sleep tracker, making sure you dial in your REM cycles and your sleep stage cycles and you hit stage four and stage three and get perfect optimized sleep. For me, uh, it, it felt like every single night I was going into battle. It felt like every single night I was going into war and trying to perfect this thing. And it gave me a lot of stress. I just lay there awake thinking about REM cycles when I should have been sleeping. So, um, I, I just cut that stuff out. All right, now fat loss is pretty hard. So how do you stay consistent when it comes to fat loss, your workout routine, and your diet plan? 
So number one tip, these are, these are powerful tips here I'm sharing. I literally took me four years and working with clients to be able to understand these. Um, so first thing you want to do is set clear goals and you want to break them down. So you want to set long-term goals. You want to think ahead, okay, how much weight do I want to lose? 40 pounds, gain about 20 pounds of muscle. Cool. Well, that's a little far out. What can I set as a six month goal? If I lose about a pound per week, six months, about 24 weeks, um, you know, I can expect to lose about 24 pounds of weight. Cool. What's that going to look like? Three month goals, monthly goals, uh, weekly goals. It's going to be a pound of weight loss per week. And then what are daily actual habits that I can take to get a 500 calorie deficit every single day? Is it walking more? Is it drinking more water? What are the actions I need to do on a daily basis to get me to my long-term goal? Because sometimes that long-term goal can be a little daunting. So if that's all you think about, you're like, okay, 40 pounds, 30 pounds, 30 pounds, 30 pounds. It's so far away that sometimes you start to lose hope and motivation. But if you work on, hey, this week, I want to make sure I'm able to get to one pound of weight loss. And that's a 500 calorie deficit per day. And I need to eat a little bit less food and do cardio on these days. It's a little more manageable to think about. And when you hit that weekly goal, there's a sense of dopamine reward that goes off. And you're like, fuck yeah, dude, let's go. Let's go. Let's tra- tackle next week again. Number two, plan. You want to plan for the week. Set a time on uh, Sunday. You look over your week. Hey, Monday through Friday, this is my, what my week's going to look like. Wednesday, you know what? I'm going to have to stay extra at work. Let me make sure I pack an extra snack to make sure I don't come home starving and go to Taco Bell and order that steak case burrito. It's going to make me oh go overboard in calories. Um, these are all my workouts are going to be. This is when I'm going to sleep. On that day when I have to go to work and stay a little bit extra, I can't go to a gym after work. So I'm going to make sure I pack my gym bag and put it in my car before work or I'm going to wake up a little bit earlier the night before, uh, go to bed a little earlier a little bit the night before so I can wake up early so I can go to a gym in the morning. Things like that go a long, long way. Otherwise, then you're just winging it. And you're going to choose the path of least resistance, which is the most convenient option, which is skipping the gym and eating out. Preparing, packing your gym bag the night before, leaving your gym shoes in the car, meal prepping for three or four days, right? You'll want to ask yourself, whatever is the hardest thing to do when it comes to your goal, you want to make sure you prepare for that. For me, the hardest thing is sticking to my meal prep. For me, the hardest thing is like grocery shopping and shopping for food. So I set time aside for that and, uh, I really don't like cooking food on the day of. So I meal prep pretty much everything for three or four days at a time. You don't have to do that. It's just what I do. Prioritize. Say no to things that don't align with your goal. You can't say you want to go to a gym, hop on a fitness routine, do a diet plan, and then your friend calls you out on a Thursday night where you have leg day the next day and you haven't ate all your calories and you know you're supposed to go home and meal prep and your friend calls you out and you're like, yeah, man, yeah, 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 I'll go out. I'll meet you at that bar and get drunk and stay out until 2 a.m. You got to say no to things that don't align with your goal, right? And you got to say yes to the things that do align with your goal. So what is that? That's grocery shopping. That's taking time for meal prepping. That's going to the gym as eating the right foods and saying no to the bad ones, right? So everything that doesn't align with those things, you got to say no to, or at least limit, or at least move them around and make sure that this is a priority. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen, right? Many people lose weight, but they regain it back. Many of people get into the gym for a few months and then stop going, right? So it's all about developing that consistency. A time management, a weekly calendar is going to be crucial. Um, I'm sharing my screen here. This is my weekly calendar, right? So you don't have to map out everything, but I map out the times I need to wake up, what I need to get done throughout that day, what I need to film, when my workouts are going to be, when I'm going to go ahead and go um, to the grocery store. All of that is mapped out. So I have a clear, organized view. And if someone calls me up and they're like, hey, let's go out on Saturday morning, I don't have friends, right? So this is an imaginary situation. Um, but let's say someone did call me up or, um, you know, dentist call me up and say, we got an appointment this day. I just look at my weekly calendar. I see, oh, I got the gym on this day, meal prep on this day, etc. I I got a plan around that, right? So a lot of people have, everyone has 24 hours in a day. A lot of people just lack time management. So they feel like they don't have time for certain things. Tracking your progress is going to help out big time when it comes to staying consistent because you're going to be able to look back. You're like two weeks ago, wow, my dumbbell bed press was at 25 pounds for 12 reps. Now it's at 30 pounds for 12 reps. Wow, I'm making a lot of progress. I just need to stay consistent in what I'm doing and eventually I will get to my goal. So ways you can track progress, you can track your workouts. You should track your workouts. You can track your weight. You should track your weight. You should take progress pictures. And then uh, tracking your food intake, it's definitely recommended. There's a few options you can take. Um, There's intuitive eating, 
following a meal plan, and then tracking your own foods. Um, but these are all ways to track progress. Expect bumps in the road. Your fat loss journey, journey will not look like a straight downward uh, trajectory. So it will not go like, you know, 190 pounds straight to 150, staying lean for the rest of your life. You'll go down to 180, regain it back. Go down to, you know, 175, go back up to 180. You'll go down to like 160, get back up to 165. And you're like, dude, okay, you know what? I've tried long enough. Let me just uh, take off the gym for a few weeks, few months. And then you're going to find yourself coming back. Um, so yeah, it's just um, if you can expect bumps in the road, challenges, setbacks, uh, re get, gaining weight back, gaining a few pounds here and there back, and then resetting your progress, it's a complete, complete normal part of the journey. Starting with any habit or lifestyle change, I've noticed that um, you know it's just a normal part. So if you can expect that, there's going to be a lot more, less suffering involved with the hiccups that do show up. Another way to stay consistent is asking yourself, what's your why, right? Why are you doing this? Is it simply just to get in better shape so you can feel better about yourself? Or, sorry, is it simply just, you know, to get in shape? Is that it? Oh, I just want to get in shape. I just want to get toned. You, you know what? That's, that's not motivating enough. What's motivating is thinking about your deep core purpose behind getting, um, losing weight, behind getting in shape. Is it because that why is going to keep going, keep you going. There's going to be a lot of hard times when it comes to your fat loss journey and the things you have to give up in order to be successful at fat loss and keep it off. You got to ask yourself, what's your why? That why is going to keep you motivated. Is it becoming the leader of your family and being a strong role model for your wife and your children? Is it becoming a better business partner, networking better, making a better first impression when it comes to business and your work and your career? Is it a personal thing? Is it building confidence? Is it building self-esteem? Is it for your health and longevity to make sure that you don't, you know, you don't grow up and become a diabetic like your parents and have to have insulin pumps and be on blood pressure meds for the rest of your life? You see how those whys are a lot more motivating. They're a lot more deep. They're a lot more connecting to your inner self, your higher self compared to, I just want to get toned. I just want to get in shape, right? So what's your why? Uh, next one, develop willpower. No goes. Dr. Human preaches that, hey, willpower can be developed. A lot of people think willpower is finite, but you can actually develop willpower. So in the morning you wake up, that instant moment where your alarm goes off and you're like, I want to hit snooze. That takes willpower to be like, fuck no, I'm not going to hit snooze. I'm going to wake up immediately. If you do that consistently, you will build willpower. It's literally just the ability to tell that one side of your brain that tells you not to do the right thing or yes to do the wrong thing and being like, dude, I'm not going to listen to that voice. I'm going to act in the right way despite what my brain is telling me that builds willpower whether it's not hitting the snooze button whether it's you know getting a medium french fries you shouldn't be getting french fries but getting medium french fries from mcdonald's and then being like you know what i'm gonna leave that right there while i'm on the way home i'll eat it at home i'm not gonna even take like one french fry out that 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 builds willpower right so if you can do small things like that throughout the day, Huberman says he does 25 no-goes a day just like that. Slowly over time, you're going to start to develop that willpower and it's going to become a whole lot easier to say no to cravings, um, say no to junk food and say yes to doing the right thing. Whatever you do, don't miss two in a row. So if you do two workouts, if you, do, um, if you miss a workout, don't miss the second one. If you eat junk food, if you cheat on your diet, don't do it that two days in a row. Don't do that two meals in a row because... You're building positive momentum throughout your fat loss journey, throughout your diet, throughout your workout plan. Once you mess up one, it's like, okay, you know what? What's going on? Are we, we're at a standstill right now. Once you mess up two in a row, now it's like you're changing the trajectory of your entire goal. And now you're hitting that negative momentum. So whatever you do, don't mess up two in a row. Do something if you can't do everything. Home push-ups, one minute of home push-ups, one minute of squats, one minute of lunges, one minute of burpees, and one minute of planks or side planks, one mile jog, and a five mile stretch. That should take about five minute stretch. So that should take about 20 minutes. And you don't even have to go to a gym. You can just do that in your backyard. So if you can't do something, just practice that habit of showing up for your health and fitness because you're just holding on to that momentum. Yeah, you couldn't go to a gym, but at least you did something. So the next day you show up, it's not like you have to start over at square zero. How do you stay consistent despite working long days at work? So uh, one thing you do is work, work out on your off days. So usually Saturday or Sunday, you might have off. So you can go to a gym on those days and you really don't need a lot of days to strength train. You can do upper body, lower body, Saturday, Sunday, and you could fit in a workout one time in the week, right? 
You could also do morning workouts. I know it might seem tough to wake up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., but I'll tell you right now, working at a gym, the most consistent crew is the morning crew. You'll see the morning crew pretty much every single day you come into a gym. The afternoon crew, not so consistent, right? They're on and off. Yeah, you'll have some consistent people, but the morning crew, they're dedicated. They wake up, wake up at that time. First thing you do is knock out their workout. They feel good for the rest of their day, and they don't have to worry about it. Home workouts help out big time. Body weight and a pair of resistance bands can take you a long way. Consider doing home workouts. And you could also do shorter home workouts, but more per week. So maybe you can't do three gym days per week, but what if you did like five or six home workouts that are like 20 minutes long and you did that in the morning or at night before or after work? So some ideas there. Do you work out in a busy gym? How do you stay consistent in a busy gym? Well, you don't have to use the machines. Learn how to do dumbbell and body weight only workouts. The If you DM me free on IG, at Coach X Ali, you get a grocery list, you get a three day strength training routine, and you get a weight tracker. And with that strength training routine, it's all dumbbell and body weight movement. So you can literally go into the core of the gym, grab a light pair of dumbbells, grab a heavy pair of dumbbells, grab your own body, you know, if that's possible, and uh, go into the corner of the gym and just knock out that workout. That way you don't have to pay attention to the big crowd. Big crowd. Morning workouts, like I said, game changer. So, how to lose fat. In conclusion, seven to nine hours of quality sleep. Build muscle mass with three to four days of strength training, 45 to 75 minutes per day. Eat less calories than you burn. Eat a high protein, high fiber diet. Control your stress levels through meditation, prayer, socializing, having friends, if that's possible. I don't know what that's like. Um, getting 7K steps per day at minimum. And then staying consistent. What are all the tips I mentioned? Yeah, Let's get, that one's going to be a big one. So your action steps are to watch the next video in the series. The next videos is going to be how to find your calories and macros for fat loss. And you need to watch that within 24 hours of watching this video. That is the action step for you. You're going to DM me free on Instagram at CoachXLE for that free grocery list, a three-day strength training routine, and a weight tracker to track your progress. That should help you get started. You're going to DM me fat loss if you have any questions about losing body fat, how to do it, specific questions around it, um, or if you're just confused and you're not sure what to do. You're gonna click the link in the description if you wanna apply for the one-on-one -on -one coaching program with me where you get a custom workout routine, you get 100 plus meals uh, that are tailor-made to you in terms of ingredients and exactly how much you need, need so it takes out the guesswork. Um, we're gonna set up your goals, we're gonna set up your daily habits, we're gonna do weekly check-ins, we have group calls, and we're gonna make adjustments to your plan. So basically all the science that I just mentioned and you're like, dude, that's a whole lot of information. How do I apply it? That's so overwhelming. Literally, you don't have to do any of the work. I'll do all the work. My team will take care of all the work. You just have to show up and do it, right? So if you're interested in that, click the link in the description. Besides that, how to find your calories and macros. Watch that within 24 hours. Let's go.